Today is January 17th, 2015. Joining us on the porch are local musicians Gypsy Windwalker and Larry R- Rapshaw and local business owner Glenn Zanzitis. That's right, folks. We're back on the porch, live from the Wooden Apple Farmstead, where we do many things. We offer a place. And we have guests today that also offer a place. We've got Gypsy Windwalker and Larry Rapshaw, who offer a place for you to be able to go inside yourself and listen and be part of yourself while you enjoy their music. We also have Glenn Zanzitis, who I wasn't sure was going to be here today. It's not a long story, so I'm going to tell it. But Glenn offers a really incredible place. His place of business is Zinc in Oswego. He offers a place for people to go. He offers a space for music and community and people to get to know each other. And Glenn was down there working last night. And myself and a couple other people went to Steamers in Oswego for a promotion and tourism meeting. And we were expecting to see Glenn there, but he wasn't. And we were sad about that because Glenn is such a community member. I was going to go out and I was going to try to figure it out. And I was going to make it my mission to know why it was that Glenn wasn't there. So as soon as I stepped out of steamers, I was going to walk right up to Zinc because it's right around the corner. And one thing a lot of people don't know is that Gina and I used to live right around the corner from there as well on 4th Street. And so we're fairly familiar with the area. And as I stepped out of steamers, I was caught caught in a moment and I was listening just standing in the middle of Steamer's parking lot and I knew right away where Glenn was and why he wasn't at that promotion and tourism meeting Glenn was stuck stuck almost in the same kind of moment that I was you see from the top of the zinc building every so often in the evenings there is incredible music that comes from the rooftop And if it catches you just right, you freeze, and you get stuck, and you listen. So it was no surprise to me that when I went to knock on the door at Zinc, that it was locked, and the lights were off. But amidst all of that music, that I'm sure on a clear, cold night, you could hear at Oswego State, because it just travels through you, through the city. But over that, I could hear from inside Zinc, Glenn saying, I'm here. I'm here, and I'm pounding on the door and saying, I'm here. Glenn, I'm here. And Glenn was saying, I'm here. I'm here, and he never changed his tone, and I pounded, and I kicked. I didn't want to break the glass. I like Glenn, and I like zinc, and I I didn't want him to have to replace a window. But all I could do was yell, Glenn, you're not going to get out of there unless you come now. And his response was, I'm here. I'm here. And there we were, yelling from one place to another, over the music, from the rooftops. I'll cut to the end of the story. How Glenn and I found each other was a long, daring adventure that we've decided we'd like to keep between ourselves, one man to another. (laughs) But once we found each other, and we were able to remove ourselves from our embrace, we made it up to the top of the rooftop. And we sat as close as two male friends can allow themselves in public. And we listened to that music. And every once in a while, we would turn to each other and gaze and say, I'm here. I'm here. And I'm so glad you're here, Glenn. And I'm so glad that Gypsy and Larry are here too. Gypsy, Larry, you're on the porch. I grew up believing boundless and dreams, hoping someday they'd come true. The boundless and dreams are now just old memories of things I was wanting to do. Nowadays I wonder if they were just nightmares 
left me with nothing but tears Kept on insisting someday they'd be mine Strode through life all these years As I head down my smile again I'm no longer bleeding in broken down dreams Of things I could have been I'm no longer reaching out for a hand No longer believing in those schemes I'm drifting down highways Losing my mind And living what I hope is dream. Get to the crossroads I know And now for an end to these dreams my whole life As I head down life's highway again I'm no longer believing in broken down dreams Of things I might have been I'm no longer reaching out for a hand I'm no longer believing in no schemes Drifting down highways, losing my mind, and living what I hope is true. Gypsy, thank you. This show is brought to you this week by Kevin's Chairs. So if you're sitting at a campfire or an outdoor wedding, maybe a graduation ceremony, how about a barbecue? You found yourself in these situations, and you've also found Kevin's Chairs. What's really interesting about this is that Kevin still hasn't found his chairs. Well, it starts with a really great guy. But what happens when a really great guy lets somebody else borrow his chairs? And they're not just chairs, ladies and gentlemen. They are nice chairs. Like the kind of chairs that when you sit down, you turn to the person next to you, whether you know them or not, and you say, this is a nice chair. Where do you get a chair like this? You know you're sitting in one of Kevin's chairs when the response from the person next to you is, I don't know. I heard a buddy Let them borrow them. And if nobody can tell you who that buddy was, if nobody can really tell you where those chairs actually came from, they're Kevin's chairs. (laughs) The next time you're sitting at that campfire, that barbecue, that wedding ceremony, the graduation, the 90th wedding anniversary, (laughs) just know. (laughs) And know that when you're sitting in one of Kevin's chairs those jokes come plentiful and powerful and know that you'll love it and you might fall asleep there but what's better than falling asleep in one of kevin's chairs is waking up in one of kevin's chairs i hear that's only happened a handful of times even though hundreds of people have fallen asleep in kevin's chairs when they wake up they're gone and this is kevin's experience ladies and gentlemen so the next time you're at a party and you hear somebody say Something along the lines of, I hear a buddy let them borrow these chairs. Know that you're sitting in the chair of a sponsor of On the Porch. Kevin's chairs, ladies and gentlemen. Kevin's chairs. 
let's check in with the man who couldn't sell water to dehydrated earthworms on a hot sidewalk. We join Philip the Priceless Auctioneer, already in progress. All right. Up for bid next is David's water bottle. This is a really great water bottle. It's blue, I think, or is it purple? I usually get a lot of uh, lot of um, a lot of input from folks. I call it input, even though it's not really nice, because they don't think I can tell the difference between blue and purple. I don't think David would carry a purple water bottle. However, I do think that David is a very sensitive and loving and caring man, and this could be a purple water bottle. The water inside may not be blue. It may not be water. It may not be clear. I don't even know. It could be Jack Daniels. It's very hard to see through a purple or a blue water bottle, but it is a blue water bottle and it's David's water bottle. Who wants to buy this water bottle? Anybody want to have a water bottle? David put his hand up. It's David's water bottle. That's not fair. He gave it to me. He doesn't get it back. Who gets it? Who gets it? Max wants the sound guy gets the water bottle, even though water isn't allowed in the sound booth. Ladies and gentlemen, Gypsy wants the water bottle. Larry wants the water bottle. I want to see Gypsy and Larry Jello wrestle for the water bottle. Anybody up for that? Can we have a Jello wrestling Larry and Gypsy up for bid? Larry Max in the sound booth wants to see Jello. Larry wants to see himself Jello wrestle for David's water bottle. David, you're not going to get the Gypsy doesn't want a water <laughs> Jello wrestle for the water bottle. I'm, is, ladies and gentlemen, I think I have to put the water bottle down. This is causing too much turmoil. Before we get into Glenn's interview, because I'm standing with my my new friend Glenn Zanzitis, I just want to point out what a what a class act we are here on the porch. This is some it's professional amazing. stuff that's happening. I'm and I would like to say that, that entire story that Matt told earlier was 100% true. <laughs> Thanks, Every, man. Everything about it. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Most people never can tell if I'm serious <laughs> or if I'm joking. So it's nice to have some real, honest, genuine support here on the porch. But that's what we're for. And that's why you're here, Glenn. Love it. I had an awesome conversation with Glenn on the phone, and I learned a ton about you. I feel like I have to talk really fast now <laughs> after that. I'm going to have to slow down. I had a couple cups of coffee, so. Yeah. I just got done pretending to be an auctioneer. <laughs> so, Glenn, you grew up in the Finger Lakes. That's right. Cuca Lake. And how did you find yourself to Lake Ontario in Oswego? Uh, I met a wonderful girl named Liz Tiffany. Who is now my fiance? Awesome! Congratulations. Yeah, yeah I followed her around basically. <laughs> yeah. But she went to school at SUNY Oswego for her master's in school psychology. Oh, nice. So um, we were living in New Paltz okay, for a while yeah. down in the Hudson Valley, which is also a beautiful area. So um, met her while she was at uh, SUNY New Paltz, and then des- we decided to move up here so she could pursue her master's. And now she's working in the Syracuse City School District in her field. So it's, uh, it was an amazing transition. Fantastic. Really was, yeah. Yeah. So she was pursuing her dream, and you found yourself pursuing one of your dreams? Absolutely. I, I was always surrounded by artists growing up. My, my mother, most of my siblings, except Trillium, I, she got the other side of the brain, I guess. But <laughs> mo- most everybody in my family were artists. So from a very little child, I'd be sketching dragons from the Lord of the Rings, nice. <laughs> which I still do, by the yeah, way. Right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, you know, I've been through different career paths, tried, you know, I, I went to school for criminal justice, um, didn't really see myself going into that field, sold cars for a while, worked in the hospitality in- industry for a while. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to me to be able to utilize my what I'm passionate about now for a career and like be able to share it with other people as well. So it's yeah. like zinc is kind of, it's my business, but it also is like a living breathing thing that like, you know, I can share with people and it's, you know, it's quite amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. And I, and I, from the experiences that I've had interacting with you, you know, performing at your space, seeing you at art openings, at, at different art associations and, and just kind of seeing you out around town. I feel like you're still doing the hospitality thing. You have, I'm sorry if, if I'm calling your business something that it's not, but it's, it's essentially, I don't know, is it screen printing? It's a, it's it, a printing it is, business. It is a service industry. Okay. And uh, I love interacting with people. Mm-hmm. So it is, It's it was the perfect opportunity. And like I said, selling cars, which... I wasn't really happy with that sort of position because it's you know very strenuous and sometimes mm-hmm. you don't you can't really be honest right. with people. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this you know still allows me to interact with people every day. It's something that I'm passionate about. That's right. It's a product that like I can actually stand behind because you know we create these items in house. Each one is a 
unique, beautiful piece of artwork, in my opinion. <laughs> right. It's like you're, you're putting a smile on somebody's face. Like every time I put another order out, you know, people are actually excited about the product that they're getting. I couldn't ask for more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about how you are constantly interacting with people. You're constantly looking to serve and people leaving with smiles on their faces because you are part of a movement, the Enclothe the project that you're doing. Tell yep. us a little bit about that. In Clothe Oswego is actually a community-driven project. Zinc is kind of hosting this drive. Basically, right now, we're coming up. It's in very early phases. Mm-hmm. We have different sponsorship levels that local area businesses or individuals can you know, donate money, which will be used by Zinc to purchase brand new apparel. Mm-hmm. The apparel will be distributed to individuals that have really no other means to to get it underprivileged families focusing on children because Mm -hmm. i know um, liz worked in the oswego school district for her internship and there is a lot of need for especially like warm apparel sure you know a lot of families are, are not really able to provide this sort of thing to their children so i think it's a very important thing that that needs to happen and we're actually we're working with a marketing group up at SUNY Oswego called Enactus. Okay. So they came to me with, with their ideas and we've been collaborating on this project and just trying to figure out, you know, how to start like giving back as much as we possibly can. So that's also like any order placed with zinc. I think I'm gonna do it indefinitely, but mm-hmm. I will give a percentage of the apparel ordered, like ten percent to this cause you know so Mm -hmm. like just keep on acquiring clothing for people so hopefully it works out (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely and do you have a like a culminating event that you're leading up to then warm up oswego at that event uh we will have a booth set up you know anybody that needs it and we're we're going on the on the trust system here so if you need it come grab yourself a hoodie and there's also going to be a couple crock pots of chili and some hot apple cider come out put on a nice warm hoodie have some hot apple cider (laughs) that's great yeah yeah really and and like i said this is the first year so i I really do hope to like you know raise a lot of awareness about it and and make it a successful event so i'm going to encourage people to come down and see you at zinc yeah absolutely Uh, not only because you're an incredible artist and you're doing really awesome things with your art but you're also doing really awesome things in the community and it and i personally and, and i know that all those of us on the porch feel personally that you've been a really great community member. Anybody wants to come into the shop, I will personally shake your hand and show you how to screen print a t-shirt. That's right. <laughs> so if you had one thing to tell people about and clothe or about what you're doing or what you feel like our community in Oswego needs, what would you say? I mean, it, it just in general, uh, I'm going to generalize a lot here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just follow what you're passionate about it, it doesn't matter like you know life it can be boring if you let it that's right so if, if you ever like if you oh i can't draw and you want to draw start drawing yeah you'll get good at it everything yeah. takes practice so that's like right. you know just like stick with your dreams you know i, I could have i could have been a police officer i could have sold cars i, I could have you know, waited tables if, if that's what I wanted to do, but I chose this path. I would never look back. I'm, I'm so happy that I did. And I encourage anybody else to just like go to it. <laughs> that's great, man. You're a great role model. Thanks Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. And here's what's happening in our area. The Woodland Snowshoe Wanders at Amboy 4-H Environmental Education Center is every Sunday in January at 2 p.m. If a person can walk, they can easily learn to snowshoe. An environmental educator will give a brief instructional clinic on technique and then lead participants for a short wander through the center's mixed woods and wetlands. There will be a walk if snow is not sufficient. The family-friendly ramble at Rice Creek Field Station on January 24th is at 11 a.m. A naturalist will lead a walk to explore trails and wetlands. Dress for the weather. Call 315-312-6677 the morning of the hike to check the trail conditions. The Art and Soul Watercolor Group show and sale at the Piano and Organ Center in Great Northern Mall will be happening throughout January. There are framed paintings, originals, and reproductions. 
Everything Illustrated 6 is an exhibit featuring the work of SUNY Oswego Advanced Illustration students. It's housed at the SUNY Metro Center at Clinton Square in Syracuse, weekdays through January. Visit oswego.edu for more information. Lend Me a Tenor is playing at CNY Playhouse running through January 24th. Visit cnyplayhouse.com or call 315-885-8960 for more information. The Fireball 2015 at the American Foundry in Oswego is January 23rd at 7 p.m. The Fireball is Warm Up Oswego's signature fundraising event featuring food, comedians, and DJ after party, as well as special prizes and raffles throughout the night. Purchase tickets at I Heart Oswego, Mother Earth Baby, Maida's Floral, or Lake Ontario Antiques, or online at warmuposwegofestival.com. On Oswego State Campus is Cruise in the Campus, Activities, Recreation, and Entertainment. Visit the Library, Planetarium, Rice Creek Field Station, or the Open Skate at Murano Campus Center Arena. For full details on activities, visit oswego.edu backslash calendar. The CNY Arts Center is having auditions for Narnia the Musical, Wednesday, January 21st, 5.30 to 8 p.m. and Saturday the 24th, 10.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Callbacks will be Saturday, January 24th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Ages 7 and up, please come prepared with a song and to read from the script. The CNY Arts Center is also offering a Writer's Cafe once a month beginning Sunday, January 25th at 6 p.m. The cafe is an informal gathering of writers to share their work in a safe and supportive atmosphere. Each writer gets 10 to 15 minutes to share their work and get feedback. All genres of writing are welcome. Contact Writing Arts Coordinator Jim Fafaya at 315-402-2297 or visit cnyartscenter.com for more information. The Oswego Music Hall has shows coming up. Frank Sullivan and the Dirty Kitchen Band on January 24th is at 7.30 p.m. And the Open Mic Night prior to that on Friday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. The Red Room Sessions at the Wooden Apple Farmstead is a time for songwriters, musicians, and anyone else who wants to build their musical skill and knowledge to get together. We share songs we are working on, bounce musical ideas off each other, and we usually have time to just play a little music. This is a supportive environment where all levels of songwriting and musical experience are welcome. It's the final Sunday of each month. The next session will be January 25th at 6 p.m. The third annual hot cocoa contest at the Wooden Apple Farmstead is happening on February 1st at 11 a.m. The winner receives a t-shirt and the honor of having your cocoa recipe served at all Wooden Apple events in 2015. Contestants may not start with a pre-made hot cocoa mix in part or in whole. All contestants must write down their recipe and bring or mail it in a sealed envelope. Contestants must also bring or mail in a sample of their hot cocoa for taste testing. You do not have to be present to win, but we would love to have you here. The Wooden Apple Farmstead is also offering a soup and bread CSA for the winter months starting the end of January. Each week you will receive a quart of soup and a loaf of bread. For more information, contact the Wooden Apple Farmstead. All right, we're going to welcome Larry and Gypsy back up to the stage. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. I got some really interesting tidbits of background information about you guys, and I'm going to make sure that I do my best to get it accurate. Let's start with when you guys met. How long have you been playing together? Three years. Three years. But you've both been playing individually. Gypsy's been playing for 40 years. 40 years. Man, that's awesome. And Larry... I want to make sure this isn't a typo, even though I think you typed this yourself. <laughs> I did, and I'm uh, OCD, so it's not a typo. Yeah, it's sure. not a typo. It's 58 years. Right. I was two years old when I started playing. Yes, of course. That's incredible. I would walk up to the piano, and the piano would be literally above my head when I started playing. That's really great. And you haven't left the piano since. Not since. That's awesome. So you guys met and started playing three years ago. Now, did you meet three years ago? Pretty much. I would have thought that you had met and had been playing together for longer than that. And so when you play together, you're playing at places like the Farmer's Market and what other kind of venues? What are That's you guys kind of where playing we got in? together. Well, um, actually, Gypsy, why don't you tell that story about Sally and how we got together? My uh, fiance, she goes to the Farmer's Market. I had something going when I was finishing a job up. And she come home and she says, Hon, there's this guy over at Farmer's Market and he's playing... Violin, 
and I talked to him, and he said he'd like to meet you. I said, okay. So that's how it took off. I went over and met him the next Thursday, and here we are. So when you play at the farmer's market, you're um, Larry, you're playing the, the violin? Violin, uh, lots of times accordion. Yeah. Well. I was going to say, I thought I had seen you with have a small owner. Actually, I think I own about four accordions. So you, when you're playing together... You're going by a different name. You're going by Locke and Levy. Yes. Is there a story behind behind that? The river, all the way up through Locke and Levy's. All the way, right. as far as you know, all the way up to Hudson. Yeah. All the way, it's all Locke and Levy's. And that's... It's, it's about playing wide varieties of music, mm-hmm. stretching from north to south mm-hmm. yeah. in the U.S. Sure. I figure locks you see on the rivers up around in these here parts. Yeah. And then down south you get the levees. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're just covering all the bases. That's really cool. Next time I take a canoe trip through the through the river and through the locks, I'll, uh, Think of lock I'll be thinking about you guys. You I'll have some of your tunes in my head as I paddle. So you you write your own stuff? Yes. Um, individually and together? Or how does that writing process work for the two of you to work together? Well, I think right now it's been basically individually. Gypsy's written his songs for many years, and I have as well. Sure. And you just bring them together and, and play together and, yeah, and work we, it out? Yeah, we'll play each other's tunes. I don't think we, at this point, we haven't written anything together. Mm-hmm. Gypsy, one of the questions that I that I ask ahead of time is, is why what you're doing important? And I got, I got... A cool quote from you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read it if you don't mind. Neither. Uh, when posed with the question, "Why is this important?" Gypsy responded, "Without music in this world, what kind of peace would there be?" And I think that's fantastic. I feel it, and it's really nice. You're a musician. If you have to do with music at all, you can feel what I'm saying. That's yeah. right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I do. And that's the way Gypsy writes, too. What's the next song you guys are going to play for us? Louisiana Blues. Louisiana Blues. Who wrote it? I did. Gypsy wrote Louisiana Blues. Somehow I knew they would I guess my music turned them away to gypsies singing rebel 
The rest of my life I'll stay right here Toss a fire with the devil Sing Louisiana blues Louisiana blues Louisiana's holding me Louisiana blues Louisiana blues Louisiana set me free Louisiana set me free All right, we're going to hear something from Gina and Gypsy. dogging him he traveled about the dog up and died he up and died after 20 years he still grieves Mr. Bojangles Mr. Bojangles Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bojangles dance. Said I danced out every chance in honky tonks for drinks and tips. Most of the time I spent behind these county bars. Cause I drink a bit. Shook his head and then shook his head. I heard someone ask him, please. Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles dance. I knew a man by jangles and he danced for you. Yeah. 
Yeah. This is David Huff. He's a contributing <laughs> writer for The Porch. And again, I'm really glad to have him back for the first time. Uh, he contributed for the pilot. He's contributing now, and he'll continue to contribute because that's what he does. So welcome to the show, David. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story here. It's been kicking around for a while. It's a childhood story, and it just kind of reached the point where, where it had to be told. It, it really did. Sorry, Mom. Okay, so my story is called, well, it happened when I was about five years old. The name of the story is called Musings of a Mouse Sweeper. It was a nice funeral, as funerals go. As this was my first one, I didn't really have much to compare it to. All the basics seemed there, I suppose. Crying, graves, haunted expressions, and some late afternoon sun. For the short turnaround needed, I thought we did pretty well. A good team effort, in fact. Of course, my family didn't start the day thinking about funeral arrangements. As a matter of fact, the day started out much like any other, with the exciting exception that it was moving day. Well, not moving day for the entire family, just for my older brother, Chris, and I. You see, Chris and I had been sharing a room with my younger sister for as long as I could remember. My parents had recently decided, though, that it was perhaps time for us to get our own space and decided to move us into the spare bedroom. It was thrilling for my brother and I. The spare bedroom was, after all, the largest bedroom in the house. It was farthest from my parents' room, so late-night brother wrestling matches or teddy bear hamper basketball games could be had without fear of waking my father. And it had the best retro 70s, 70s decor you could possibly get in the early 80s, complete with neon purple shag carpet and light brown wood paneling. There was, however, one slight issue which needed to be addressed. Okay. This issue was the fact that, like most spare bedrooms, they tend to stop being spare and start being something else. In this case, our new bedroom was currently being occupied by an office, or as my father liked to call it, the den, or as he also liked to call it, his den. My father had spent a lot of time decorating his den, trying, I think, to create some separation between adult and kid space. There were bookcases lining the wall filled with important-looking books, a fish tank with a goldfish population dependent solely on how well his children could throw styrofoam balls into small plastic fish bowls at the state fair. And of course, a very uncomfortable couch with a hideaway bed. After all, it was a spare bedroom, so there had to be some nod in that direction. The centerpiece of the office, though, was a large, handcrafted office desk. Now you may be thinking, handcrafted. So, beautiful polished oak deep drawers, maybe even a hidden one somewhere, shiny brass hardware, a large leather office chair, you know, a desk worthy of a man's den, or an episode of Frasier. (laughs) There may have been a chance my father would have pictured a desk like that when designing his den. However, lacking materials such as oak, leather, and brass to work with, he decided to work in the mediums of plywood and cinder block. So picture a piece of plywood supported in three locations by stacks of cinder blocks, and you will have a good approximation of what this desk looked like. Now, my father did put some craftsmanship into his desk. He sanded and stained it, curved the corners, and sealed the edges. However, when all was said and done, the desk was still just a piece of plywood supported by cinder blocks. To add insult to plywood, no matter how often my dad cleaned and organized his desk, my mother, drawn by the newly opened space, would just fill it up with new stuff. In the end, however, Chris and I both agreed that an oversized plywood cinder block desk had no business being in our new room, and so it had to go, along with all the books, fish tank and associated fish, and hideaway bed. Hence, moving day. Now, moving day was progressing quickly, and come early afternoon, we were nearly done. In deference to my father and recognizing that perhaps my brother and I moving into his den might have been more hostile takeover than gifting of space, we saved his desk for last. The desk removal looked fairly straightforward. After all, we only had to lift off the plywood desktop and relocate the cinder blocks into the garage. However, once we removed the plywood desktop, we found that a family of mice had taken up residence inside one of the stacks of cinder blocks. Now, it wasn't quite a full family. We had a mama mouse and four baby mice. However, the daddy mouse was conspicuously absent. Maybe he was off finding food for his family or working late at the office. In the end, it was probably best that he wasn't around for what happened next. (laughs) Before we continue with the story, I would like to take a few moments to tell you a bit about my mother, 
and in particular, about her love of life of all kinds. Whether it be dogs or cats, ladybugs or spiders, my mother was a friend to all. She had strong opinions which she shared openly and often about conservation of habitats, not polluting our oceans, and one that was near and dear to our geographical area, saving the spotted owl. So upon discovering a family of mice living in our house, to her, it was less a nuisance and more an opportunity to lead by example. To walk the walk, so to speak. To show her children what it meant to stand by your words. To ultimately, and compassionately, save the mice. So what started out as a moving day rapidly evolved into a family-led rescue mission of epic proportions. The end goal, to safely capture Mama Mouse and her four mouselings and relocate them gently to the woods behind our house. Of the two objectives, relocating the mice was the easiest. The first one regarding capture turned out to be slightly more complicated than one would think. You see, the stack of cinder blocks was three high, and the family of mice had taken up residence in the very bottom of one of the openings, so in order to get to them, someone with long arms would have to reach down into the hole to gather them up. Of the family members available for this task, only my mother had arms long enough to reach the bottom, and oddly enough, she did not feel comfortable reaching down into a hole full of mice. A plan was quickly developed. We would unstack the cinder blocks one at a time until only one remained. We would then place a bag over the remaining block and coax the mice into the bag, thus completing our first objective. While the overall plan was solid, someone brought up the possibility that the mice could become agitated during the unstacking process and make a run for it. This caused some concern with my mother. After all, no matter how much my mother liked animals, she was not thrilled with the possibility of sharing her house with a family of mice. So we needed a contingency plan in case the mice bolted during a rescue attempt. It was time. The plan had been developed, gone over, revised, gone over again, roles were assigned, reassigned, forgotten, and then remembered. Everyone had pottied and my baby sister had gotten her drink of water. We were ready. Our plan was simple. My oldest brother Joseph would be the block mover, and my mother would have the bag ready to capture the mice. She would also be the one responsible to chase down any mouse that tried to escape if startled during the block lifting phase of the plan. My older brother Chris and I had a special job. You see, it is a well-known fact that when mice attempt to escape from a room, they will immediately look for the nearest exit, in this case the bedroom door. So Chris and I were given the important responsibility of sitting in front of the open door and preventing the mice from escaping through it. In order to accomplish this task, we were each given a brown manila folder and instructions that if they mouse came at us attempting to escape, we were to sweep them back into the room using our provided folder. It was reinforced multiple times that we were to gently sweep them back. No impromptu competitions were allowed to see how far we could fling the mice, and there were to be no stealing of mice. If one was escaping on Chris's side of the door, then it was his mouse, and vice versa. <laughs> it was a big responsibility my mother had assigned us. But we were ready for it. We were ready for anything, really. As our impromptu funeral came to an end, I looked down over the freshly mounded graves in the flower bed and contemplated, as one typically does at a funeral, the series of events which led us to this particular moment. Ultimately, I decided it was perhaps not the wisest choice to assign the responsibility of lifting a cinder block to someone who, when confronted with scampering mice, will scream like a little weenie and drop said block. <laughs> On the bright side, gravity, coupled with the force of two cinder blocks coming together, did not leave us any survivors. With the events of the day, I am not sure we would have been up for caring for an orphan mouseling or comforting a mama mouse who had lost her children in a freak, cinder block, house crushing accident. <laughs> the mousecure, as it became known in my family, stayed with us for an appropriate amount of time and then faded from our collective memories. However, I often wonder what impacts were left with my mother. After all, she had just crushed a family of mice in front of her four small children, and that kind of thing just doesn't go away. Like a soldier suffering from PTSD, did she have frightening dreams of her own children being crushed by oversized cinder blocks? <laughs> or find herself shell-shocked and walking around in a daze looking for an exit, only to have it blocked by an oversized manila envelope? <laughs> in the end, I believe this event affected her the most. Perhaps at the moment the two cinder blocks came together to snuff out the lives of one, one mama mouse and her four mouselings, a piece of my mother was also lost.
Thanks, David. I'd like to introduce On the Porch's own music director, Gina Holsoppel. He played politics like a game of chess. He the king and soul, I was the queen, I guess. I got sacrificed when the time was right. So I chose to get out of that game. And every time I have to make that choice, I'm by the water and she's singing my song. And I've got no choice but to start singing along. She sings note after note after wave after washes me over. an ocean unless you're an oak tree what to do if you're just me i really don't know unless you're a pirate unless you're a cowboy unless you're divine what to do to be just fine unless you're you who knows what to do You're the chosen one, like a golden sun. I'm the tag along, I'm the vagabond. You said get out there, make them look at you. You said I'll be here, show what you can do. And every time I have to make that choice, I'm by the water and she's singing my song. And I've got no choice but to start singing along. She sings note after note after, wave after washes me over. to do if you're just me I really don't know unless you're a pirate unless you're a cowboy unless you're divine what to do to be just fine unless you're you who knows what to do now my dreams they're all learning how to crawl they are grinning cause soon they'll be big and strong and every time I have to make that choice I'm by the water and she's singing my song and I've got no choice but to start singing along she sings note after note after wave after washes me over unless you're an ocean unless you're an oak tree what to do if you're just me I really don't know unless you're a pirate Unless you're a cowboy, unless you're divine What to do to be just fine, unless you're you Who knows what to do Now every time I have to make that choice Every time I have to make that choice Now every time you have to make that choice Choose to be you Eighteen sixty two Louis Pasteur credited with the rabies vaccine. After a young boy attacked by a dog confirmed to have rabies, Louis Pasteur worked with some other scientists to convince the family that they might have a cure. And so they injected the young man over the course of thirteen days with a vaccine that eventually saved his life and kept him alive. Fast forward 125 years later. Leroy and Marie were deciding that they were going to do their part to help lower the spread of disease to minimize the amount of anguish caused to people that came to visit them at their farm, and to increase a healthy bat population. So on the 4th of July on 1987, they decided that they were going to build and hang bat houses all over their farm. It got to be the end of the day. They had both committed to this project, and they had committed to not going anywhere and joining people for their 4th of July festivities. They were going to hang bat houses. But it was late. Leroy was tired. 
Marie had made some incredible ribs, and he just wanted to enjoy them. He had one bad house left. But he decided it might be a really great way to celebrate the morning because they had decided they were going to get up on the 5th of July and see if any bats were coming back to their new homes. And so he left that one bat house leaning up against the side of the barn, right next to the barn door. Went into the house, had some ribs, had some great conversation, and realized that there was a couple of things that he needed to take care of before he went to bed. So, he went outside, decided to open that barn door, and as he did, the barn door then hit the bat house. The bat house started to slide. Leroy tried to catch the bat house. The bat house hit the ground, and out of the bat house flew a bat. But Leroy was bent over trying to catch the bat house as it was falling. So he was in prime position for this bat to fly straight up, right into the hood of his sweatshirt, which he had pulled over the top of his head. So at this point, Leroy being the fast thinker that he is, he was stuck. Do I scream, rip off my hood, and try to get the bat out? Or do I scream and run to the house and try to get Marie to help me get the bat out? And as he's deciding this, he knows that screaming is, is going to have to be part of the plan. <laughs> and in that moment, he gets sidetracked. And he thinks, yes, I'll scream, but I have to save the bat. Because now, I've had a bat come in contact with my skin on my head and my face and my neck. And it's stuck in the hood of my sweatshirt. And if I get scratched by this bat, that means I could have rabies. And the only way we're going to know is if we get the bat tested. So he decided to scream and pull his sweatshirt off while at the same time trying to keep the bat inside the sweatshirt. (laughs) He hadn't decided how he was going to kill the bat yet, but he knew he had to kill the bat. But you have to save the head because they test the brain. They have to test the brain. That's how they find out if the bat has rabies. They can't take its blood. So he has to save the bat. No, he has to save the bat brain. He has to kill the bat so they can extract its brain and they can test it for rabies. All the meanwhile, he has it in the hood of his sweatshirt. And he's screaming. Well, of course, Marie comes out of the house and there he is, rolling around on the ground, trying to pull his sweatshirt off while trying to keep the bat in the sweatshirt and screaming. So Marie's trying to find out what's going on and he's yelling, a bat, a bat, a bat. And she says, oh my God. And she starts screaming. So now she's standing over him screaming while he's writhing on the ground with his sweatshirt halfway on and halfway off while trying to keep the bat in the hood. And so they're both screaming and she just starts hitting him. And so now he's screaming, what are you doing? And she's screaming, I'm killing the bat. And he's saying, no, save the brain, save the brain, save the brain. And she's saying, I don't know. I can't see it. I just want to kill it. I want to get this. And so he's trying to coach her through getting the sweatshirt off and saving the bat, especially the bat brain. Leroy didn't know about Louis Pasteur and the young man and the dog attack. He didn't know about all of the things that had happened over the last 125 years and all the lives that had been saved by the rabies vaccination. All he knew was that there was a bat in his hood that was very angry. He needed to get his sweatshirt off. His wife was screaming. And then there was that little piece about if the bat gets away or we destroy the brain... I'm going to have to pull my pants down and get a shot in my butt. (laughs) And if that's not motivation, well, at that moment, Leroy did what any man in this situation would do. And he jumped to his feet and ran. Not the smartest move, but he's now running with his sweatshirt halfway off, trying to get it off while trying to save the bat and the bat's brain with his wife running behind him screaming. At which point, their neighbors pull into the driveway because they need to know what's going on. And of course, with it being the 4th of July. And there's really no regulations in Tonkahogan for fireworks. So everybody has fireworks. 
and the lights were just right. That the neighbors, while sitting in the car with the glare on the windshield and this man running around trying to pull his sweatshirt off with his wife screaming, could only mean one thing. He was on fire. So now, the neighbors are chasing the wife who's screaming, who's chasing the husband, who's got the bat in his sweatshirt, and he's really the only one that knows what's really happening. So after about 15 more minutes, the message was able to be relayed, and they were able to successfully extract the sweatshirt, well, no, extract Leroy from the sweatshirt. See, they ended up having him lay on the ground, And one person held his t-shirt down because that's the courteous thing to do. Like, let's not take off all of his clothes. Let's just get the clothes we need. So one person holds the sweatshirt while Leroy very bravely just put his hands over his head and they pull the sweatshirt off. While another person was wadding up the sweatshirt, starting at the hood because that's where the biggest hole is. And they rolled up the sleeves and they rolled up the bottom and now they've got a bat inside a sweatshirt. And so... Being as conscientious as they are, they decide to take the sweatshirt, wrap it in duct tape, stuff it inside a grocery sack, tie the grocery sack, wrap that in duct tape, and stuff it into the back of the freezer. In 12 hours, they'll have a frozen dead bat. And if you want to preserve something and kill it at the same time, you freeze it. So now they've got a perfectly preserved bat brain that they can send to the health department. Nine days later, Leroy was sitting on his couch, sweating. His heart was pounding. And he was thinking, I would have that moment all over again. Because he was still waiting for the results from the lab to tell him whether or not that bat had rabies. And he was pretty sure that if he went much longer... If they found out that he did have rabies, the vaccinations weren't going to work. He'd had it too long. But on the 10th day, he got the phone call from a very, very helpful and very happy health department worker who said, that bat was fine. You're going to be okay. And he wasn't sweating anymore. But he couldn't remember how great those ribs were either. So he convinced his wife to make him another batch of ribs so that he could sit down and really enjoy them. But he's not sure that he'll ever be able to eat ribs or celebrate the 4th of July or really ever check his bad houses again. But every morning, he goes out, does his chores, and he takes care of everything. And as he walks out of the barn, as the sun is rising up over the hill across their property... He can stand at the top of their hill and watch the sun as it breaks over the trees. And he can look over and he can see Marie and he can smile and he can sing. This This is my home. This This is my only home. This This is the only sacred ground that I have ever known. Should I stray in the dark night alone? Rock me, goddess, in the gentle arms of Eden. Rock me, goddess, in the gentle arms of Eden. And that's our show, folks. I want to thank Gypsy Windwalker and Larry Rapshaw. I want to thank Glenn Zanzitis. I want to thank David Huff for being guests on our show today, for contributing to such a wonderful day. I want to thank everybody at Concert Window. Thanks for being here. Everybody that's listening to our podcast or listening to it on YouTube, thanks for being here. And we'll hear, well, no, you'll hear us, or maybe we'll see you here at the Wooden Apple Farmstead next Thursday. Take care. On the Porch is a production of the Wooden Apple Farmstead with host Matthew Wood. Our musical director is Gina Holsoppel. Our stage manager is Ray Monet. Our sound technician is Maxwell Wood. Contributing writers for this show include Matthew Wood, Gina Holsoppel, and David Huff. Special guests include Gypsy Windwalker, Larry Rabshaw, and Glenn Zanzitis. 
find information about past shows, being on the po- porch, and much more online at ontheporch.weebly.com.